sure many of you in the room think you are a good golfer. Uh, yeah, no, okay. Some of you are willing to admit that you are terrible, but sometimes, uh, and particularly at a course like this, you are able to be in the presence of greatness. You walk down those corridors, you see all those individual clubs from some of the winners here over the years, and it is amazing today for all of us in this room to be in the presence of two of the full legends of this magnificent game. So please, can I ask you to put your hands together for Tony Jacklin and Jack Nicholas. so nice to have you with us today. Thank you so much for spending the day here at Wentworth. Um, now what we're going to do is, uh, we're in the presence of greatness, so we thought we'd have a little bit of a, of a master class. Um, Tony, I know you're a big fan of the, the short form of the game, so you're going to talk a little bit about short game. And Mr Nicholas uh, is going to talk about course management, which I don't know about you, but something which I get wrong virtually every single time <laughs> I step on a golf course. So, um, Mr Jack, if we can start with you, um, Wentworth is a tricky course anyway. Short game is always essential in golf, so perhaps... Uh, some little tidbits that we could take away with ourselves today and, and hopefully play a little bit better than we normally do. Well, uh, I can only go by my observations over 50 years playing pro and uh, A lot of the short game is about making the right decision with what you want to try and do. And uh, I think uh, a lot of amateurs tend to pick the high-risk club too often. You know, not everybody can hit the lob wedge and chip uh, uh, with the delicate touch that a lot of the top pros have. So uh, I would opt to keep the ball closer to the ground, around the greens, if you can, if there's a way. Uh, take the simple route, is, is, would be my advice. Um, and uh, obviously with, uh, with putting, uh, again, uh, it seems a simple uh, most people think they can putt, but uh, my observations are that uh, you get consumed by thinking you're going to make the putt and you don't think about the one after. So putting is very much uh, pace and speed, and if you can go out and just think these simple things, because it's the human aspects of it that let you down in most, you know, you rush and uh, make, as I say, the wrong club decisions, getting out of bunkers, uh, you get in there and you panic a lot of the time, a lot of the amateurs do, they don't open the club face enough and commit to, to the shot, the fear of the shot takes, takes over. I think we all appreciate that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but beyond that and, and sort of, uh, as I say, it's the human stuff that, uh, that, that comes into play. And, uh, can I ask you, when you've got, let's say, I'm sure many of us will have that sort of four, five, six footer today, do you ever think about technique at that moment, or are you just sort of naturally going with what your body is telling you? Yeah, I think about technique. It all goes through uh, your head, but you've, you've got to do that before this, you, you hit the putt. You know, obviously, positioning yourself properly, you're thinking about keeping your head still, um, you know, taking the Either through online, all those things, but once it comes to uh, pulling the club back, that's all been done, or should have been. Uh, and and uh, the, the big mistakes are, you know, people make uh, trying to do it while they're still, well, the club's in motion, <laughs> well, you can't do that. And uh, uh, if you just stick to the fundamental things and think it through, it's, it's much easier. And uh, that's all I would say about it. I think the man alongside you has probably seen his fair share of mistakes from others over the years as that's well. A, that's the first, first chipping and putting lesson I've ever had. Was <laughs> 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 it a good one? Very good. I was listening, I was listening hard because I can't chip and putt at all. <laughs> In fairness, you've done all right. <laughs> never, never wanted to. I could care less about it. <laughs> Except that I need to make one. That's what I care about. Now, you're talking about course management. Course management is, uh, I think, a totally individual thing. And each of us uh, have got to understand, uh, I always say, you've got to understand who you are. And what I mean by that is some are single-digit handicaps, some are double digits, some, I don't think quite reach triple, but <laughs> some get pretty high. And, and if you understand who you are, what you can do, 
then you and if you understand that and you believe it, then you could actually become a golfer. And so, uh, what I always try to tell somebody, and I, I get a lot of the, the young guys that come to me with it, and uh, uh, I get a big kick out of it because I'm, you know, how many, how many of you that are, you know, are Tonys of my age, which are in the seventies. I'm still in my seventies, not by much, and uh, uh, you know, have the 20, 22, 23, four-year-olds come to you and ask you questions, and I know my grandkids and kids never do. <laughs> Some of the golfers do. <laughs> kids never listen to you anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so what I, so what I, what I usually tell the guys, I said, okay, uh, let's just assume that you're an 18 handicap. That's going to be probably the average for most people that are in the room today. Maybe, maybe 14 might be. I don't know. I don't know how well you play, but let's just say that you're an 18 handicap. What is an 18 handicapper supposed to do? An 18 handicapper theoretically is not supposed to hit any greens in regulation. So it, it, the idea is to try to figure out how do I play every hole. Let's say every par four that I can, so I can get onto it in three, uh, or every par five so I can get onto it in four. In the par threes, where am I going to miss a par three to where I can make sure I can get it all the green? If you can do that every time, you're going to give yourself an opportunity for a par. And uh, instead of standing back there and say, oh, I, well, that's 230 yards, I could, I remember I hit a three with 17 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's exactly the thing that you want to do. And so that that is how you... You figure out what you could do, how you could do it, and then if you if you if you actually can, can accept that that's what you are, you'll be a better golfer. And if you're an 18 handicap, and if you could play that way, and all of a sudden you're, you'll you'll shoot like a 14, and then you'll say, okay, now I can do that as an 18. I can do that as a 14 now. And I think about that. That I maybe have four par threes I can hit it at. And the rest of the holes I can play the same way. Then all of a sudden you're going to become a 12, and then maybe a 10. That's how you improve your golf game. And uh, I always I always use the 15th hole at Augusta as an example. I'm sure you all are familiar with seeing the 15th hole at Augusta on television. That's why I use it. Uh, I'm playing that golf hole. Uh, I get I get uh, and I get the young pros come to me. And we sit there and talk about it. I say, okay, guys, you hit the ball off the tee, and you've left yourself 200. And 50, 60 yards to the green. Okay, you're going to sit out there, you're in the fairway. What, uh, how many times do you think you might knock the ball on the green? Half the time? Well, where are the other half going to go? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I sit there and I say, well, I probably you're going to get two or three or four going to go in the water. And that's that's not acceptable to me. So now, if I hit it, that, but let's just say you hit it down to 200 yards from the green. For those guys, that's probably a five iron shot, or maybe six, maybe seven today. I mean, it was from 200 yards was always a three iron for me. <laughs> and but I mean, if you hit it down, let's just say you're 200 yards away, and uh, you're gonna they're gonna be playing. Let's just say a four iron, five iron. How many times are you gonna knock it on the green? Oh, I'm knocking it on the green at least nine times. And where's the other one going to go? Well, it's not going to go in the water. Okay, that's the time to go for the green. <laughs> so not the time when you're back or 250 yards. I remember getting through that. I remember telling, I think it was Rory I was talking with, I was talking about that, that situation. And then they came out with, uh, they had a um, special on me uh, called Jack. I don't know whether you saw it or not. It was the head of the three-part thing on the Golf Channel. And, and it, it was in 1972. And I'm back at about 260 yards with the wind howling in my face. And I pulled out a three wood, hit it as hard as I could, and barely got it onto the front edge of the green. And I said, wow, now that's not exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Do as I say, not as I do. And, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's playing, it's always playing within yourself and doing, that's how you manage. And I always stood on, on a tee and somebody said to me, okay, I said to myself, can I drive the ball in the fairway here with the driver? I said, if I felt pretty confident with that, then I hit my driver. If I didn't feel like I could hit the ball in the fairway, or there was, a, there was significant trouble, 
I'd go grab a three wood. Can I drive it in the fairway with a three wood? Yeah, I think so. So I'd hit it. Well, I'm not sure I can. Well, then I wouldn't hit it. I didn't. I'd go back and get it. Grab a one iron. You guys know what a one iron is? <laughs> that's, gen that's generally speaking what you cut, cut your toast with in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Field 66. That was, you won that uh, oh, okay. with a one iron. Oh, I, went, I had a one iron uh, 20 times off the tee in that tournament, probably. I only hit 17 drivers the whole tournament. So, you know, so it's all about doing, I mean, uh, I use Rory because you, you, Rory would obviously relate to you guys over here. Rory came to me, this was about 10 years ago, and uh, he was down, down playing in the Honda tournament in Palm Beach, and he was going to meet with one of these uh, site coaches, and the, a friend of mine told him, he says, well, he says, you got the best one right across the road over here, Jack. I said, you know, why don't you just go call Jack and sit down with him for half an hour? So Roy called me. And we sat down and had lunch. We sat, we sat down for about an hour and a half. And we went through a little, little bit of what I'm just telling you here. I says, Roy, I says, you got to understand yourself. you got to understand what your ability is, what your sh shortcomings are, what can you do and what can't you do. And you got to be patient. Patience is a, is a, is a most important thing virtue you can have when you're learning how to play golf and play around the golf. Be patient with what you're doing. And so we, I, since I, I think I got through to him. So about three weeks later, he's playing in Charlotte. And he shoots 63 in the last round and wins the tournament. He wins by, I don't know, six or seven shots. So I dropped him a note and I said, I said Rory, I said, I told you to have patience, but I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, that was, that was one. So, so then, then it turns out about a year later, he's playing and he shoots 80 the last round at Augusta. And I saw him a couple weeks later and I said, okay, I said, now you shot 80, you played a bad round, do you, do you understand what you did, why you did it, and did you learn anything from it? And he says, he says, I know why I did it, I think I know why I did it. I, know it. I said, okay, that's great. And you'll be able to apply that as you go into the U.S. Open, which was in a couple of weeks. That was congressional. What do you mean by eight, eight shots or yeah. something like that? So I dropped him a note and I said, well, I said, you obviously learned something from Augusta where you wouldn't have won. I said, but more important, did you learn anything while you won? So now you learn from what you lose, but you also learn from why you win. So now you learn from your successes, you learn from your mistakes. And you put that together, and that's, how you, that's how you manage game of golf. That's how I manage it. That's, a, that's why I've played all my life. I, I, I go back through uh, uh, my career. I'm a little, totally a little long here probably. But, uh, I, carry on as long as you this, like. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to open this up to some questions. Is that what you're going to do? We're going to go back to Tony in a minute. Oh, okay, carry on. Okay. I'll, I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I go back. He's, he's, he's gathering the information as well. I go, I go back to 1960. I was an amateur. I was playing the U.S. Open at uh, Cherry Hills in Denver, and I played the last two rounds with Ben Hogan. And uh, we were both at 142, and uh, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a great experience. But the best experience that happened was that I, I got to lead the tournament, and I was leading with six holes to play, and I, and, and I three put at 13, and I three put at 14, three put 13 from 12 feet. And, and then I missed about a, a four footer for a birdie at 16, I missed about an eight footer for a birdie at 17, and I bogeyed 18. To lose to Arnold by two. And I always turned, always turned to Palmer and I said, Palmer, I said, I had shot 39 the last time, nine holes, nobody ever heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> and he always turned back to me and said, yeah, if I had three putt nine times at Bookmont, nobody ever heard of you either. <laughs> so anyway, um, we got done with the tournament, and I think it was the best thing that ever happened to me that I didn't win. Because if I had won, I'd been scratching my ears out here like this, and I wouldn't have learned from it. And I learned from that. And, you know, uh, I remember going uh, at, at Lytham in, in, in 63. Uh, you didn't play that. You were two. I did. I played. Did I'm you play that? Yeah. You about, what, about 18 at the I time? I finished 30th. I was 19. 19 at the time. Okay. <laughs> and so, 
Anyway, so I, so I came into the last two holes with a two-shot lead over Charles and, and, and Rogers. And I hit it on 17 up the right side, and three went off the tee. That was the back of the green. I had 212 to the hole. And uh, Jimmy Dickinson, it was the first week Jimmy caddied for me. Jimmy came from down here. And uh, I said, I had a little wind in our face. I said, I need a two iron to get it back. And Jimmy says, you don't need a two iron. You don't need to get it back there. And I said, oh, yeah, I do. I said, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't listen. And I know I never did listen to my caddy very much. <laughs> but but it's sometimes sometimes you need to use it as a as a backup, and, and as a sounding board. And I hit the two iron, and I was, I was charged up. I hit it through the green and made bogey. I had an awkward chip. And, and, and all chips were awkward for me. But anyway, I, I, made, I made bogey. And then I walked over to the 18th tee, and Charles and Rogers were on 16, but the wind was blowing down the hole. And I sort of waited to sort of watch what they were going to do on 17, or 16, and I didn't hear a sound. They both hold 20 footers for birdies. So I still thought I had, even though I did that, I still thought I had a shot lead, because I didn't know they'd birdie, because they didn't have scoreboards in those days, or leaderboards. At 18, I tried to carry that left bunker. And it right in the face of the left bunker and dropped down in the call he was wedged out and make five. I thought I tied for the tournament. But I lost. They both had birdied that, so they both beat me by a shot. Well, what did, what did that tell me? It told me that I really, when you got a two shot lead, you got two holes to play, everybody else is going to have the same problem as you are. They're going to be nervous too. So you got you got to remember that, you, that you know, if you play smart and, and you learn. I mean, Tiger did this for years. He'd look at the leaderboard, and he'd see, he'd see Smith, Jones, and whatever up there. And he says, well, I don't, and I don't need to do anything. All I need to do is make pars. And but if he saw, uh, if he saw Jacklin or Palmer or Player or whatever he do, he better, he better, better play. So, uh, you know, so I learned that you, you really all you have to do is play within yourself. You play this, play the smart shot. Come up, you know, you'll probably come up. If I played the smart shot, which would have been a three iron at 17, I'd have I'd had, I'd have won the won the open at And, but anyway, you learn from all those things. That's how you learn. That's how you gain the. That's how you gain the knowledge to learn how to play within yourself. That's what all of you, you know, you need to think about what you do, why did you do it, what did you do wrong, what did you do right, and then you you learn from that. That's a long version of. What you asked me. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm taking away from that is we're all getting the same advice you gave to Rory McElroy, and it's okay to three putt from 12 feet because the best in the world does it as well. Um, Tony, just to come back on, on, on uh, what Jack was saying there, that ability to learn from victory and from defeat. In 69, we're going to talk about the Ryder Cup a little bit later on, but you were, at 69 and 70, you were playing the best golf of your career. Did you learn more from victory or, or more from those tournaments that just slipped out of your grasp at that time? Well, I think I learned more from the screw-ups than I did from the, from the victories. The victories uh, tell you that you belong in, in, in the the environment that you're in, and you, you know, I was <coughs> playing with Jack virtually every week through the, the late 60s, practice rounds, tournaments, whatever. Jack, Arnold, Trevino, and uh, so I felt, you know, the victories told me I belonged there, but the, the mess ups, you know, you go back and you think, you know, you think what you did, I think in in, in the 72 when Trevino chipped in five times the last two rounds and on the 71st hole. <laughs> Why did you mention that as well? <laughs> because I look back at that and I lost patience. You know, I, I just wasn't patient. Uh, you know, I was, he was over the back of the green in four and I was just short in two. He made five, I made six. And I run out of patience, and you're not allowed to. That's a, a no-no, you know. At that at that point in my career, that shouldn't have happened, but it did. Um, and I know there were extreme circumstances, but there's always extreme circumstances. So, uh, and uh, you know, you 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 mess up and, and lose, and you look back, you go back inevitably. I used to go through the round with a fine-tooth comb. 
happened because I wanted to be as good as I could be. And you have to be truthful with yourself and, uh, you know, <coughs> dust yourself off and start all over again when it, when it comes to that. It's, uh, it's, it's a hard game. And, uh, but you, you, truth, it's a game of truth. Uh, it's just like guys who think they can make it without putting the time and, and effort in to practice. And when the real pressure's on, that all comes to the surface. You know, did you put the time in? Uh, do you know in your heart that you put the time in? Or did you try and cheat on it? Those sort of things. And I've always uh, told my kids, as, as they've grown up, a couple of them are pros, that uh, it is a game of truth. And uh, you, you've got to put that uh, time and effort in to, and, and realize, as Jack just said, that everybody's nervous. Um, <laughs> The reason we're here today, uh, we teed off on 18 at Burkdale in 1969, and I got my tee shot in the fairway first, and I head down ahead of him, and he hollered at me, Tony, and I waited, he caught me up, and he said, are you nervous? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like I was, but I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> we were two good friends. By this time, he's got his hand on my shoulder. We're walking together now, just off the, off the tee, down this little sandy um, path. And I said, Jack, I'm petrified. He said, I just thought I'd ask you, because if it's any consolation, I feel just the same way you do. And, you know, with all your teammates sitting around the green, waiting, your captains both sort of everybody there waiting to see the outcome of this. Uh, we, I think we had a right to be a bit nervous, uh, but uh, I think you all know uh, where it ended up. And, uh, but that's the fun of it at the end of the day, you know, being able to handle that. And then, of course, the more often you're in that situation, and uh, nobody was in it more often than, than Jack, uh, the more you learn to handle it, and you, the, the more you realize it's not, not just about you, it's about the other guy as well, and he's, uh, you know, we're all in the same boat. And it's, um, but, but if you can handle it, he, to, to me, Jack always handled those high pressure circumstances uh, better than most, because he'd been into them most often, and, uh, and figured it all out. But the, the panic mode didn't hit uh, with, with him as often as it did with his uh, contemporaries, you know? I just didn't let anybody know about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been um, absolutely fascinating. What I, what I love about the pair of you is that you have a friendship forged on the golf course, and you can still see that friendship and that respect so many years on. So thank you so much. Please give a lovely big round of applause.